Josh is about to be introduced, but before that, let's put our hand over our heart. If you're new with us, go ahead and stand with us, and uh, let's make some declarations together. I am who God says I am, a child of God, the righteousness of God. I am the apple of God's eye. I am God's workmanship, created for good works, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today, I open up my mind to receive the word of God so I can think like God, be like God, and do life the way God intended for me to live. Let's lift up holy hands, say this with me. Come, Holy Spirit, help me elevate my thinking so I can elevate my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you remain standing just for a second? You know, as a dad, when you raise your kids and you speak over them and you believe God for them, and I can remember when Josh was a little boy, I'd just tell him, I'd say, put your hands in my hands, son. There's healing in these hands and how God has raised him up. And now at 30 years of age, uh, we call him the future. And I'm excited today to introduce my only son, Josh. He's going to speak to y'all today. Come on, son. So happy. So happy. Well, good morning. Uh, you can be seated, and uh, it's been a great, it's been a great weekend so far, and it's going to be a great day today. And uh, just always, I, I feel um, so personally grateful that um, that I get to be a part of this church. Not just that I get to be Keith Craft Sonnel, that's a huge honor, but but I get to be a part of a, a church like this that um, that that is just so great because y'all are so great. And so, can you give yourself a big hand? And um, you can clap for yourself better than that. Because, uh, because what we believe is that the church isn't, although we happen to have a pretty great building, the church isn't a building and it's not teams and it's not, you know, programs and all this different stuff. The church is people and, and we're the church. And, uh, and so when we're great, the church is great. And that's the, the awesome thing is that because of how great all of us are, our church is a great church, and it's just great to be up here. I'm going to stop saying the word great now. <laughs> um, but we're, we're starting this series called Pillars this weekend because we're talking about all of us are trying to build our lives on something. We're all trying to figure out how to build our lives and, and what to do with our lives. And so what we want to do is spend a couple weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about uh, the pillars that we need to make a part of our life. And the first pillar is having a new life. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what that means. And we have people all throughout the auditorium that have notes. If you'd like notes, they can hand those out to you. You can put your hand up and the ushers will get that to you. What we like to do here is we like to give you some notes so you can follow along, kind of see where we're heading and keep those for yourself. And also, if you use version, our notes should be on version as well if you're more prone to using digital stuff rather than paper like me. But, um, we all are trying to build our foundation, our life's foundation on something. And I think one of the big questions that all of us try to answer as human beings and all of the, what we're trying to figure out is what is the meaning of life? Is there a meaning and is there a purpose to life? And what if there is one, then what is that meaning? And that leads us to asking all kinds of different questions like who am I and what is morality and is there a God? And is there a such thing as destiny? And what, how does that interplay with free will? And are we alone in the universe? Are there aliens out there somewhere? And what happens to me after I die? And we can really get into all these really deep philosophical questions. And when I think about this kind of stuff, I'm reminded of a quote from Socrates where he says, the only true wisdom is in knowing that you know nothing. And uh, so I think we're just going to set a baseline and, and understand that uh, there's a lot that we don't understand about the world and the way things work. And I'm not just going to be really super philosophical today. I want to be practical. But the question that I want to start uh, asking is, I want to start this by asking is, what is the meaning of life? And is there meaning and purpose to life? Because all of us are trying to figure that out, whether we can articulate it that way or not, whether we can say it that way or not. All of us are trying to figure out, is there a meaning and a purpose to my life? Is there a meaning and a purpose to situations and circumstances and relationships? And if there is such a thing, then what is that? And where do I find that? And every decision that we make can be traced back to us trying to find purpose and us trying to find meaning. 
the kind of friends that we seek, the kind of friends that we pursue, the kind of relationships that we have, they show where we're trying to find meaning. The kind of car that we drive, the kind of clothes that we wear, the people we do life with, and the job we have, all of those things come back to us trying to answer this question of what is meaningful and what, what in my life helps to produce meaning for me. So the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. And he, that, that's kind of the starting thought process that, that I want to give to you. Is the first point there in your notes is that God has placed eternal meaning in my heart. So we're all on this constant search for meaning. And if we go back to the very beginning of the Bible, the very first part, the very first part of the Bible where the Bible talks for the first time about humanity, the Bible tells us that we are created in the image and the likeness of God. And what that means is that you and I are more like God than we're like anything else. You're more like God than you're like the chair that you're sitting in. You're more like God than you're like a chair. You're more like God than you're like an animal. God has created us, each one of us, in his image and according to his likeness. And so that means that there's a part of us that's, with, that's deep within us that, that identifies and connects with God more than it connects with anything else. And so God has placed eternal purpose and eternal meaning in my heart. All of us are trying to, and, and the way I want to quantify that for you is all of us are trying to search for more. We're not satisfied with the way our life is right now. We're not here in this room today because we feel like everything's operating at 100% effectiveness and efficiency. We feel like our marriage can be better. We feel like our friendships can be better. We feel like our job can be better. We definitely always feel like we can make more money and we can have more stuff and we can take more vacations and have more great experiences. And so there's this inner desire for more. And so when I say God has placed eternal meaning in our heart, what God has placed in our heart is this, this never-ending desire for more. This never-ending desire for more. And God created us for, for this search and for this journey and for this purpose. But there's so much that we don't understand in life. There's so much that even when you look at the physical world, even when you look at the way that, that uh, our bodies work, there's so much that we don't understand. The, recently, a, a week ago, a week or so ago, some of you might have seen in the news, but they, they discovered, uh, there was a medical study that was done that discovered that there's a new organ that we didn't previously know that existed in our body um, that now we've just, in the year 2018, been able to actually show that this exists. And, this organ is called the interstitium, and they have a picture of it uh, up here on the screen behind me. And I'm not, I, I have a film degree, so I'm not really that well versed in science, but, uh, so I'm not going to describe to you what interstitium necessarily is, but what interstitium does is it's uh, between, um, it's, on, it's just below, it sits just below the surface of our skin. It's also between all our muscle and fibrous tissue. It surrounds our veins and our, arter and our arteries, it's in our urinary systems, it's in our lungs, it's in, it lines our digestive tracts, and it's, and it's the, an organ that exists between all of our existing organs and bodily systems. And I don't know how long that scientists have studied and doctors have studied the human body, uh, but the fact that in 2018, after years and years and years of studying the physical body, we're just now able to see this, shows how little that we might know even about ourselves. Because if there's one thing that I feel like I'm really great at, it's being a human being. I can move my hands, I feel like I'm kind of an expert at that. You know, I've conquered, I've conquered breathing. Like that's a thing that I'm, I'm good at surviving and living and staying alive. My heart beats and uh, it works and I can move my eyes around and I can stand and sit down and you know, all the things that it takes to be a human being, uh, I feel like I've got that figured out. And uh, at the same time, there's so much that I don't understand about what happens to me physically. Like if you ask me what makes your heart beat, I couldn't really answer that question and neither could you. Cognitive psychologists say that we still can't really understand fully how the brain works and how it operates. We can like try to attach things to it and try to say, well, this is how the brain works and this is what most, re most recent science says, 
but there's not really like a quantifiable explanation for all the ways that we work as human beings. And so I feel like if there's one thing that we should really have confidence in and know, it's how we work. But even in a very physical sense, we don't even understand how we work as people. And we're still learning how to do that in the year 2018. So there's all this physical stuff in the world that is hard to understand. But then at the same time, God's placed eternity within our hearts, which means there's stuff that I don't even, I can't even maybe comprehend. And there's stuff that I can't even maybe see. And there's stuff that I can't even put words to that God has placed in my heart a desire for. So when I talk about purpose and meaning, how would you describe purpose and meaning? When I talk about destiny, how do you describe a destiny? You can't, you can describe uh, eyesight. You can describe what a heart looks like. You can describe a new organ. You can't describe these things. And so what God has placed within us is this desire for more. God's placed within me a longing for things that I can't see and things that I can't know now. And that's evidenced by the journeys that we take through our lives. That's evidenced by the fact that none of us that, that uh, are currently married, we're probably just satisfied with being single. We're not just satisfied in our job search, in our career by where we're at right now. We have a deep <clears throat> longing for more than what we have and what we experience today. So that's why we feel like as a church that God gives us this book. Because there's, there's a God that created us and there's a God that placed meaning and purpose inside of us. And the book, the Bible is not a series of rules and regulations for you to follow. It's also not something that we feel like needs to be taken literally all the time, no matter what. But we do feel like that it's, the Bible is this thing that if you could, if you could take God's heart and put it on paper, that's what the Bible is. Is if there's a God that's created us and he's put eternal meaning, this search for purpose and this search for more in my heart, if he's created me with that and for that, then what he's done is he's given me his heart to be able to understand the God, the, the, the him that he is. So he created me and he created me with a part of him and then this book helps me begin to understand what that part of me is and how that part of me can connect with him. Because the second point in your notes is that God created us for relationship. He created me for relationship. There is a pull, not just for me for more, there's a pull for me for him. If you go back to Genesis chapter one again in the Bible, when God created the first ever human beings, he's really clear on a couple things that he created us for. The first thing he says is he created us for relationship with him. The second thing he says is he created us for relationship with each other. And the third thing he says is he created us to rule the earth, which means to do something significant. The thing about all three of these things is they all require relationship. I can't ever do anything significant by myself. And we all know that. You can't be on a journey by ourselves and really conquer the world and make great things happen if we're not aligned with right people and if we don't have good business relationships or family relationships we're not really going to do anything great alone and then what we know though is that that what happens in our life and what happens in adam and eve's life in the story of adam and eve god created them and he and he created them for a relationship with him created them to have great relationships with each other he created them to do something significant in the earth and what happened was they began to make mistakes they begin to be human beings because that's if there's one thing that we're also uh, experts at, it's messing up. We've also, we're also experts at kind of like not making things go really well. And some of you have been involved in situations where, um, like I have, where everything would be great except there's people involved. <laughs> so we're those people, though. We make mistakes and we have our own dramas and our own issues and each one of us sitting in this room and if you're in McKinney and you're watching this wherever you happen to be, uh, you're a person that's got your own complicated life that you're trying to live and that you're trying to figure out. And it seems like, at least to me in my own life, that every day I make it more complicated by the decisions that I make. And so what happens in our life is we're a lot like Adam and Eve in that they made a mistake or they made mistakes and it messed up those three things. When I make a mistake in a relationship, it messes up that relationship. When I mistreat somebody or when, I, when I'm negative about them or when I do something wrong that hurts them, it messes up my ability to have relationship with them. And it messes up our ability to do something significant together. And the same thing happens with God, that what happens is the mistakes that we make 
separate us from the purpose that God created us for. And that's called sin. That's what the Bible calls sin. A sin is an archery term that just really simply means to miss the mark. So you're aiming for something and you miss. And that's what sin is. So our sin affects our ability to accomplish the purpose that we feel like and the meaning that we feel like God has given us and God has established for us. So our mistakes affect our ability to have relationships and our inability to have relationships affects our ability to find fulfillment. Because what God says, again, to go back through this and to make this really clear, what God says is I've placed eternity in your heart. I've placed a longing for more in your heart and I want you to find fulfillment. And then whenever you make a mistake though, it's gonna bring you further and further away from fulfillment. So deep within our hearts, we long for all these things and we know there's something within us that says there's more, but life is really complicated and confusing. At least we make it seem that way. Paul, the author of the book of Romans, writes in Romans chapter 7, I don't really understand myself, for I do what I want to do, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it, and instead, I do what I hate. So there's this big pull for us towards more, but then, but then within us, we also have to admit there's a pull that oftentimes is stronger for the things that we know that we shouldn't do, the places that we know that we shouldn't be looking for fulfillment in. But it's really attractive. It's called temptation. That's what the Bible calls temptation. But it's really attractive for us to do the things that we know that we shouldn't do and to feel like that God's placed eternity within our hearts. He's placed a longing within me for more. And so I can seek that out in a relationship. I can seek that out in a circumstance or in a situation. And it might not be sinful, but the mistake for me is misunderstanding that I can't find my purpose in things and people. I can only find my purpose in longing for the more that is eternity for me. And that's the core mistake that each one of us in this room makes probably every day, is looking for our fulfillment in the way people think about us, looking for our fulfillment in the way we think people are supposed to treat us, looking for our fulfillment in people meeting our expectations and acting a certain way, looking for our fulfillment, how much money we make or what kind of car that we drive or whatever kind of rooms that we find ourselves in. And then at the same time, this is how complicated we can make it, at the same time we feel like we're looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places, we make mistakes in the midst of that. And then what do we do? We sit there and we go, you know what, I messed up today, I made some mistakes today, but tomorrow I'm gonna try harder. Next time I'm going to try harder and I'm going to make less mistakes. So the harder I try, the less mistakes I'm going to make. If I work harder, people will love me more, God will love me more, and I'll have more meaning because of how much I've worked on myself. So the harder I work to create purpose, the harder I work to create meaning, the more meaning and purpose will be created for me based on how hard I work. And the honest truth is that we're not stronger than the mistakes that we make. We're not stronger than all of the, the trying harder doesn't lead to anything good. Because all of us in this room, we're all trying really hard. And we're all, we all keep hearing about how much we're missing it. We all keep feeling like we're missing it. We all walk around and maybe we have some guilt and maybe we have some shame and maybe we have some regret. And that regret is not because we didn't try hard enough. That regret is because trying harder doesn't produce any kind of result as it relates to the meaning and the purpose and the destiny on your life. So what we have to admit to ourselves is that no matter how hard I try, I can't do it. I can't overcome it. No one's stronger than that. No one's stronger than the pull to make a mistake. No one's stronger than what's called temptation. And we're just working so hard and we're trying to figure it out and we feel like, man, one day, all my hard work is going to produce some kind of result where I feel less, where I feel more fulfilled, where I feel like I have more purpose because I've worked so hard to produce that. In Acts chapter 16, there's a story about a man named Paul and a man named Silas, and they were in jail because they preached the gospel, and, and an earthquake hit the jail, and all the doors came open, and all the chains fell off of these guys, and it was this really miraculous moment that happened. And in Acts chapter 16, the Bible says the jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. 
He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. When he brought them out and asked, sirs, then he brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. We can read this. It sounds like this really amazing, you know, if we've walked with God, it sounds like this really powerful conversion experience when to me and my um, my perspective is that the jailer was not asking, uh, was not going to kill himself because he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He wasn't going to kill himself because he felt like he was going to hell. He was going to kill himself because he understood very practically that during the Roman era, if you were a jailer or a warden of a prison and one of your prisoners escaped or something bad happened with your prisoner, you would take their place and you would be killed in a very dishonorable way. And so when he, when he comes to Paul and Silas and he asks, sirs, what, I must, what must I do to be saved? What he's asking is, what must I do to be saved from the consequence of this jail falling apart because of this earthquake? What do I need to do to be delivered from that? He wasn't asking Paul about Jesus. He wasn't saying, hey, tell me how I can get to heaven someday. What he was saying was, I'm about to face some really horrible stuff. And can you guys please tell me how I can avoid whatever I need to do to avoid that? And Paul shifts everything though and he changes everything he he, he basically get, tells the guy it's not about being saved from this present consequence it's about being saved from this mentality that makes you feel like you have to be saved from this present consequence it's about understanding that this jailer's perspective is that he spent all this time the guy's responsible for the jail he spent all this time building this jail building this prison to keep people in and at the end of the day, he couldn't do anything about the earthquake. So we can, we're just like the jailer. We can spend all this time trying to build our life a certain way, trying to make ourselves seem a certain way, thinking that, okay, if I make it look this way and if I present myself this way, eventually I'll be this way. And that's a lot of great do-goodery ideas and all that kind of stuff, and that's wonderful. But what Jesus comes and says and what Paul says in this story is it's not about us delivering ourselves. It's about us understanding what true deliverance looks like. You see, the, ver the word that the jailer uses in this story is this word sozo. And it's a Greek word that means to be set free, to be made whole, and to be healed. And so by ourselves, we can't deliver ourselves. And I grew up in church environments where people would ask questions like, hey, are you saved? Or have you been saved yet? And what we can think is that salvation is somehow all about eternity. And it is very much about eternity, but it's not all about eternity. It's about on this side of eternity as well. Are you saved from the mentality that says you gotta keep trying harder? Are you saved from the mentality that says, hey, just sin less? Are you saved from the mentality that, that makes you find fulfillment in people and circumstances and situations and substances and jobs and everything that the world says and culture says that you should find fulfillment in? Are you saved from that? Are you delivered from that? Are you made whole by yourself? Do you feel good about who you are? Do you have peace in your heart? Are you set free or are you held back by stuff? Do you feel like that because of the mistakes that you've made, you'll never qualify for your life to have purpose and meaning? Do you feel like that because of how messed up you feel like that you are, that relationships will just never work out for you? Do you feel like that because of however it is that you've done life that God just doesn't love you and he won't love you and he won't be for you. The purpose of being saved and delivered is to connect us to this eternal meaning and this eternal purpose. And we have this longing desire for more. So I can be set free in a moment from a mindset. I can be set free from an addiction. I can be set free from sickness. I can be set free from disease. I can be set free from feeling like my life's going to look just like my parents' life. I can be set free from the community and the culture that I was raised in. I can be set free from racism and bigotry and hatred and all kinds of different stuff if I want that. But again, we're trying really hard. So maybe if you can just go here with me for a minute, it's not about trying any harder. So this, this, I have these three uh, bases here. 
And this represents sin, and this represents you and me, and this is representative of God. You see, sin, like I said, just means that we make mistakes, means we mess up sometimes. But the thing is, when you make a mistake, it doesn't matter how big or how little the mistake is. When you make a mistake, you're, you're contaminated. There's nothing, so I've poured this in here. You and I know there's nothing I can do to get it out. There's nothing I can do to separate these things. So when you, and I, when you and I make mistakes and we screw up, there's nothing that we can do to separate us from the screw up. There's nothing we can do. Can't, I can't put my hand in here and try to draw it out. I can't, you know, try to run it through this towel. It's just going to make more of a mess than I've already made for myself. And so what I have to identify is that there's a part of me that God created that longs for him. And as soon as I decide to go that direction and say, God, I need your help, what begins to happen is the God that created me begins to separate things from me that I once wasn't separated from. And he comes in and he begins to work in my life. And this isn't about anything that I did, but it's about everything that he did. But then the awesome thing, the awesome thing about God is that wherever God is, there's no sin. So what the Bible tells us, what the Bible tells us is that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So where there's mistakes in our life, where there's screw ups, where there is where we're finding, we're trying to find purpose in all these other things and all these other, in all these other situations and circumstances, all God does is he said, just ask me for help. I don't have to try harder to be delivered. I just have to ask God for help. Back to Adam and Eve and the mistakes that they made. The mistakes that they made separated them from a relationship with God. Because God hates sin. God hates the mistakes that we make. And the mistakes that we make separate us from him. And the harder our life gets, the more mistakes that we made, the more, the more mistakes that we make, the more we're just fundamentally human beings, the more we begin to lose hope. The more we begin to see all the disconnection and the lack of meaning and the consequences of our mistakes as something that we just deserve. We try to convince ourselves that we deserve our shame, we deserve sickness, we deserve guilt. And the truth is that we deserve all of that and we deserve even more. But... God sent his son, Jesus. The Bible tells us in the most well-known passage of scripture that's ever been written that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that if we would just believe in him, we would, God would connect our lives with the eternal purpose and with the eternal meaning. You see, the mistakes that we make separate us from relationship. Just like if I was your friend and I made a bunch of mistakes and I lied to you or I, 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 took, I stole money from you or whatever it is that I did to you, it would cause us to have a separation in our relationship. And just like that happens between people, that can happen between me and God. But then Jesus comes in between and he says, I'm here to restore a relationship between you and the God that created you, not because you got to try harder, not because you got to figure more out, but just because I love you. And just because this is the purpose and the reason why I created you, God has placed eternity within our hearts. He's created us for relationship for no other reason than the fact that he loves us. There's nothing that we can do. Just like there's nothing that you and I can do to separate ourselves from, from the sin, there's nothing that we can do that can separate us from the love that God has for us. Just like you saw me pour that into that vase, I couldn't separate the sin, but now that God's involved, I also can't separate God from it because there's a part of me that God has created that wants to align with him. And there's nothing that I can do. There's no mistake that I can make. There's no place that I can go that's too far that separates me from him, and that's called grace. So God wants to deliver us. Not just today, but God wants, us to, God wants to deliver us every day from everything that we feel like has held us back. And I want you to just end this moment, I want everyone that can hear my voice just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Because you might feel like that everything's great between you and God. You know that 87% of Americans claim to believe in God. And I'm not asking you to believe in God right now. 
What I'm asking you for real is, are you set free from stuff? Are you sitting in, in this room today? Or are you sitting at Dow Middle School in McKinney and feeling like I'm a free person? I don't have shame. I don't have guilt. I don't have condemnation. I know how much that I'm loved. And I know how great my future looks like. And I know that I'm free to pursue that. And if you're not free right now, this moment is for you. Because it's not just about heaven and hell, although that's really important. It's about on this side of eternity, us feeling free to be who God's called us to be. It's about on this side of eternity, understanding that God has created you with purpose and meaning, and he has a great destiny for your life. And there's nothing that you can do or, or whatever that could separate you from how God feels about you and what he wants for you. He's placed it within your heart. And right now, whatever is in your heart needs to align with the heart of God. So everyone that can hear my voice with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you if you're free and if you know you're not free. We all know the stuff that we've got to be delivered from, that we've got to be set free from. That we need God's help to just get past our issues. We need, God, we need God's help not to be angry anymore. We need, we need God's help to not be like our dad or not be like our mom or not be this way or that way or not be like we used to be. God, we need to be set free right now. It's really easy. I want to count you in a prayer. And if that's you, you just go, hey, I got to be set free. I just feel it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I just want you to raise your hand. So that's me. I got to experience some freedom right now. I got to let go of the past. I got to let go of who I was, who I used to be. I got to let go of my struggle. I got to be delivered. I got to be made whole. I got to be healed. I got to be set free right now. You can put your hands down. I want everyone that can hear my voice to pray this prayer and repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. I choose to serve you. I choose to put you first. Right now, set me free from everything that's held me back. In your name I pray. Amen. It's that easy. So you've now started the journey. We've all, we've all gotten to this place now where we're, we're maybe for the first time or maybe for the hundredth time, it really doesn't matter. We're just in the right place with God. Where all of a sudden we realize that this purpose and this meaning that, that he can, he's the only one that can fulfill that. He's the only one that can get me there. It's not in a person. It's not in a circumstance. It's not in a situation. But I have this eternal longing within me for more. And the more that I need can only be found in God. Every solution, every circumstance, every situation that happens to me in my life, he can add meaning to it because I want him to. And now we're all there. And there's a third thing that's really great that we're about to all get to go experience. We're about to experience in McKinney. We're about to experience here in Frisco. And that's that God wants me to be new. God doesn't just want us to, God doesn't just want to save us and then say, hey, just kind of stay where you're at. He wants us to be made new forever. Second Corinthians chapter five says that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So again, there's something in us that longs for more. And that means that the more that we want, the more we pursue, the more that God has for us, the more we can leave the past behind. The more we can let go of who we used to be. The more we can realize that there's an old, there's an old us and there's a new us. We're leaving behind our parents' way of doing things. We're leaving behind our ways of doing things. We're leaving behind all the other stuff that we feel like has held us back and we're becoming new in Him. In Romans chapter six, Paul describes all of us in this place and he says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ, that sin might lose its power over our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin.
What you and me got to understand is that there's a new person right now that's sitting in your seat that wasn't maybe sitting there five minutes ago. What you got to understand is you don't have to be a slave to whatever it is that you felt like you were a slave to. You don't have to be held back by what it is that you've been held back by. But you are new and you can be new and you will be new, not through your own power, not through trying harder, not through making more happen, but just because the power of God has entered your life right now and he's beginning to lead you, and he's beginning to guide you, and he's gonna take you on this journey. And there's all kinds of conversations that have to happen between you and God. This, this message today is not just a be all end all for the rest of your life. He gives you his word because he wants you to know his heart. And then as you begin to know his heart, your life begins to have purpose again. He begins to breathe new life into your body and everything begins to become new. And baptism is important in that because it represents that we're choosing to kill the sinful part of us and we're going to be made new. We're not gonna be held back by our mistakes. We're not gonna be held back by what our past looks like. We're not gonna be held back by the feelings that we felt about ourselves before, but we're gonna be made new, not because we say we're new, but because God says that we're new. So is there something in the water? No, there's no holy water, it's from a hose. <laughs> but this is an outward expression of what's happening in our hearts. When we give ourselves to God, he begins to work in our lives and lead us and guide us. And that's where what we call the Holy Spirit begins to work. And that's really biblical language, but the Holy Spirit is just called an, a helper. He begins to lead us and guide us and we, we begin to be attracted to the things of God. We begin to like, like going to church. We begin to like listening to worship music. We begin to like uh, the words of God that are written in the Bible. So it draws us away from what we used to feel fulfilled by and draws us towards what we should and need to feel fulfilled by. So each one of us in this room, we're on a faith journey. God's leading us and he's guiding us and we've all made that commitment today. Faith is something uniquely personal that happens between us and God. We allow God to lead us. It's a private decision that we feel, feel like needs to go public. We call baptism the wedding band of Christianity. The wedding band that we put on when we get married, it doesn't make us married, but it signifies that we belong to somebody. And that's what baptism is for us. It's us, it's us saying, you know what? I'm new. I'm made new, and I belong to God. Just like when you get married, you join a family or you start a family. When you decide to get baptized, you're saying, I'm a part of this family. You're saying, you know what, God? It's not just about me and you from this point on, it's not just me and you, it's me and all of these people that we're gonna help each other and we're gonna be there for each other and we're gonna just be God's family trying to figure it out and let him lead us and guide us together and everything is gonna constantly be made new in our lives. Does that mean we're never gonna sin? No, that doesn't mean we're never gonna sin. But that does mean that from this point forward, God's grace is sufficient for us and his power, his power is made perfect even when we are at the weakest point in our lives. So we have baptism that happens every, the first Wednesday of every month. But today's a really special day because we get to go outside in just a minute and we get to have a party. We get to celebrate what God's done. And you know, the interesting thing to me is that we put in 424 parking spots over the past couple months. And over 440 people came to know Jesus last weekend at Easter. And so we're going we're gonna to celebrate them and we're going to celebrate each other too. Some of you came this morning and you're signed up and you're already ready to go. Some of you just think baptism sounds like a really good idea right now. What I want to invite you to do is, and, and Pastor Lance can have some instructions from McKinney in just a minute, but what I want to invite you to do is if you want to get baptized today, right after this service, there's going to be pools set up outside. We're going to be having a great time and celebrating the fact that we're made new. But if you want to get baptized today, if your kids want to get baptized today, I want to invite you to go to the conference room A and B. It's just right over here, right after service. And we'll have a little brief introduction. We'll give you some shorts. We'll give you a t-shirt. And then we're just going to have a great time and we're going to celebrate because it's going to be awesome. Hey, let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that we're made new in this moment. I pray right now that you would encourage us. God, that you would lift us up, that you would inspire us. We would know that you're for us and you're not against us. God, I pray right now that you would connect 
our, our heart with your heart. You're the God that created us. You're the God that's for us. And God, I pray this morning and today that everything is made new in our lives forever. Not just today, but every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.